hand, show of hands, who here has ever played the lottery? Okay. I'd say most of you. Okay, when you play, do you select how many people, of those who play, how many actually fill out a play slip and, and select numbers individually? Three. Okay. So this is kind of about the people who actually do that, who choose their numbers. Which numbers do they choose? So that's... That's the basic motivating question. What are the most popular and least popular selections that players make in the lottery? Um, problem is, there's no publicly available data that will directly answer that question. So I looked at an equivalent question, which is, which selections will win the smallest or largest expected prize amounts in a parimutuel lottery? What parimutuel means is that instead of promising a given prize whenever you match a certain number of numbers, what the lottery would do it does is set aside a percentage of sales for that prize level, and however many winners there are, they equally divide that money. So <clears throat> when the lottery happens to draw a very popular selection, those prize amounts are going to be small because they're divided among many people. And when the lottery draws a less popular selection, the prices will be larger because there's fewer people sharing it. So you can indirectly get an idea of which combinations are popular and, and less popular. And so, okay, so want to find out which selections are popular and how much does that matter? If you play a popular selection, how much does that really affect your expected, expected winnings? So the way we're going to do this is use the data that is publicly available which you can get by scraping what I did, uh, several different websites. And the basic data that you get there is the numbers that were drawn and the dollar amounts that were awarded at each prize level. So I did that for several lotteries, uh, mostly um, what are called cash five games, where you're selecting five out of 30 or 40 numbers in Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Texas. And then also for fun, it's mostly for the, um, because of the web scraping challenge that I wanted to do the Oregon Pick 6 game. Uh, so for the Cash 5, I was looking at prizes for matching 3 or 4, because the jackpots, the winners are so rare that you can't really get good information about that. And for the Oregon uh, Pick 6 game, uh, looking at just matches for um, prizes for matching 4. Okay, there's a lot of words on this slide. Um, I don't recommend reading it because your mind will go numb, and that's kind of the point. Um, there's lots of little details that differ from game to game that you have to keep track of. Uh, just to give you a quick idea, sometimes lotteries will change the number of numbers that they're selecting from, which changes their prize structure. You have to be aware of that when you use the data. Uh, some lotteries, um, when the top prize is not awarded, instead of carrying that over to the next draw, they divide it among the people who uh, won the second prize something else that you have to take into account when you work with this data. So one of the, the initial challenges I had is how do I keep track of this without doing a lot of hard coding and how do I make sure that this information is stored in just one place and my code is always, always reading from the same place. So what I decided to do is use a PostgreSQL database to help me keep things organized. So. Um, the components of the database are, first of all, the data that I scraped from the various websites, each in its own table. That's straightforward enough. Uh, then a table that had information about the game. So the information you need about a game is how many numbers are being selected, out of how many numbers, and how far back can you go and still have data that's still applicable to what's, what's going on today. And then analysis basically means it's a combination of a game and a prize level and whatever information you need to do need to um, take into account, like the, like the rolling down the first prize to second prize, um, all that information that you need to do to, to keep, keep your data um, on track. So I set up the R code in such a way that the R code just needed one ID from that analysis table and using foreign keys and you know, coding the names of the, of the data tables and the game table and things like that. Um, it was just one ID that my R code needed to pull in all the information it needed to form a uniform set of features that I can use in every analysis. And another thing that kept things very uniform is the carrot package, which is a package in R specifically for machine learning. And what it, it kind of is a wrapper for dozens of different machine learning models. And no matter what model you want to use, you can 
put it into these caret functions, make a few adjustments in your code, and um, being be able to grind through a lot of different machine learning models without doing a lot of recoding. So when I had those results, I wrote them back to the database, and then there's a view that I had um, to basically the most important view in the database is um, gave R, the R code a very simple syntax for saying, okay, for each one of these games, what was the most accurate machine learning model? Uh, so the features that I uh, calculated for each one of these games, again, keeping them a very uniform format, one, what numbers were drawn, and I ordered them from least to greatest, and one being the latest, least, and K being the greatest. Um, and then I calculated some, arith some arithmetic type operations on the numbers that were drawn. The sum, just to get a feel for overall, did in a particular draw, were there big numbers drawn, were there small numbers drawn? I um, also want to look at the range of the numbers and the standard deviation of the gaps between the numbers. The idea there is when people fill out play slips, a lot of times what they do is they'll fill out across a row or a column or a diagonal, and that creates a uniformity in what they're choosing, and I thought maybe that would show up in, in the prize data. So those are all treating the numbers in a purely mathematical numerical sense. I also put in flags for each number, F, uh, flag FI, Meanings for a particular draw, fi is one if and only if the number i was drawn in that, that particular drawing. The idea there is um, if you just look at them numer these numbers numerically, the difference between 11 and 12 and the difference between 12 and 13 could be quite different. Right? 11 is kind of considered a lucky number, 13 is an unlucky number. A lot of people play birthdays, so 12 may be a kind of a key cutoff point in terms of popularity. So the flags are meant to capture those ideas. So I tried several different models, uh, regression using various combinations of these features, elastic net, which is a way to do regression and avoid overfitting, random forest, random forest with boosting, um, allow the trees to have depth up to three, and again, use carrot to um, train these models and also to help select the best, um, best parameters for each one. And when, um, after running things through carrot, I used a testing set to decide of the best regression and best random forest, et cetera, which one performed best on a testing set, and that was how I decided to choose each model for, for each analysis. Um, I also held out all the data since uh, August 1st of this year. I didn't use any of the most recent data for training or cross-validation or model selection, just kept it totally untouched, and then tested the results. And so here's some, some pictures of how these models performed on um, on data that was completely fresh to them. And you can see yeah, models performed pretty well overall. So I was pretty happy with these models, except for one thing, and that is they were not answering the questions that I wanted to answer, right? Because what are these models doing? They're saying, okay, give me this set of numbers, and if the lottery draws these numbers, this is how much they'll pay out. That does not answer the question of what can a player expect to win if they win for a given set of numbers. So what you have to do to answer the, the motivating questions is, like for example, to evaluate the selection, player selection one, two, three, four, five. You need to apply, apply the model to one, two, three, six, seven, one, two, three, six, eight, one, two, three, six, nine, and I can go on for quite some time uh, giving you examples, but I think you get the idea. Um, in my favorite, because I'm from New Jersey, um, to do that for the New Jersey Cash 5 game, you would have to apply the model to 7,000 possible combinations to figure out what your expected prize is for given selection uh, for matching three. And there's almost a million combinations. So you have to figure out an efficient way to do that. So that was, that was a problem that I faced even after doing all the machine learning. So one efficiency you can do is just pre-compute the model for all 960,000 selections. Because just like each time you evaluate a selection, you have to apply the model 7,000 times. By the same token, the model is being computed 7,000 times on the same combinations. So rather than repeating those calculations, just do them once and look them up. Uh, now, a way you can uh, make the lookups a lot more efficient is to put the selections in dictionary order. Then when you have a selection, you can very quickly find where the model result is in your list and get the results um, very quickly rather than trying to do a filtering on five distinct numbers. So when I put in these efficiencies, I got the um, execution time for one evaluating one selection down to 
eight seconds, which is fine if you only care about one selection. To go through 960,000 would take eight or nine days. That was not an option. Uh, so I decided what I had to do, and this, once again, the um, trade-offs between accuracy and other considerations comes up. Um, what I decided to do is see, is there a less accurate model that will still give me good results that I can, can compute a lot faster? <clears throat> so all these are equa equations are showing is just what I described. For To evaluate a given selection S, what you have to do is find all the combinations that match it in a certain number of places and apply the model to each one of those and average them. Okay, so that's, that's not helping us get more efficient. So one idea I had for making this more efficient is, okay, if I restrict myself just to linear models, then instead of computing the model on each of the 7,000 matches, I can find the average of the inputs, stick the averages in the model, and that will give me the same answer because it's a linear model. And that's fine, except that you then have to evaluate the inputs on all 7,000 combinations. But with those flag variables that I calculated, you don't have to do that. There's actually a very nice formula, just see there, where that gives you the average of the flags for all the combinations that match in M places the, um, the selection S that you're interested in. So instead of taking your selection and running, through, running the model on 7,000 combinations, all you have to do is evaluate this linear function that has 30, 40 terms in it much faster. Um, rather than taking eight or nine days to do one of the 12 analyses, I was able to run all 12 in one hour. And more than half that time was the Oregon case where there were over 12 million combinations. Okay, so let's look at the results. Um, I put several results on, um, on one uh, output. So for now, just focus your attention on these columns that are labeled N1 through N5. And look at these for a few seconds and you'll probably notice some patterns. One, very small numbers, lots of odd numbers. Oh, very small numbers, but not these smallest numbers. One and two are not there in any of these most popular selections. Uh, seven is in all of them. Eleven is in all of them. Um, and uh, as I said, mostly odds. Okay, results for the same game, so a lot of overlap. Not that surprising, but let's go to a completely different data set in New Jersey. Once again, low numbers, but not the lowest. Lots of odds, lots of sevens, lots of elevens, nothing over 12. Um, patterns broken a little bit on the cash four. Um, I said match four for New Jersey. It's a shorter data set because they changed the uh, rules fairly recently, and the four match is kind of um, inherently less, uh, less predictable because there are so many fewer winners. Um, but if we just kind of go through the ones for matching three, once again, low numbers, not the lowest, lots of odds, lots of sevens, lots of elevens, nothing over 12. Same thing. Uh, pattern gets, oh, uh, again in Texas, same patterns overall. Most popular numbers are very much the same in different states, completely different data sets. Um, patterns broken a little bit in Oregon, where apparently those players like one and two better than a lot of the cash five players. Uh, so another thing to call your attention to is uh, these quantities that I, uh, that I calculated here. So in the last column, that's the expected prize for a given selection, you know, considering all the possible ways that you can match and all the possible uh, prizes that can be uh, paid out. So this was one of the reasons for doing the averaging is does it make a difference, right? Could it be that once you average over all the possible numbers that your selection can match, maybe there really isn't that much difference, but actually there is. So in these, for example, you see the expected prize is around $7.80. The top expected prize, if you pick the very largest numbers, it's almost $9 more than that. So what's happening with these games, essentially, is really the most loyal players, these are the people who have their favorite numbers and they play probably every day, the most loyal players are actually getting an inferior product. Another way to look at it is the people who are trying it, maybe doing uh, a quick pick, which is more likely to give them a higher, um, uh, higher paying combination if they win. If they do win, they're going to get more reinforcement than the people who play regularly because, hey, the people who play regularly, they don't really need reinforcement. So it's good marketing. 
but I kind of makes me ethically not feel so good about having been in the lottery industry for a while. Um, okay, one more thing I want to show you is, and this goes to interpretability, is for one of these models, the uh, Pennsylvania Cash 5 matching 3, these are the actual coefficients that you see. So it's um, basically the way the model works is there's some constant term that depending on which numbers, which five numbers are drawn, you add or subtract, usually subtract some number from your, your running total to, to get the average prize. And so what you see here is right about here, these highly negative numbers kind of have smaller magnitude. And then here, you go small again. I don't think it's coincidence that this drop off is right around 12, 12 months in a year. This is right around 30, 31. There's 30 or 31 days in most, most months. I think what's going on is people play their birthdays, their kids' birthdays, their spouses' birthdays, and those tend to be chosen more often, resulting in, in lower prizes. Um, so that's, um, that's where, it, where it is so far, and I hope you enjoyed it, and we welcome any questions. So you got lottery tickets when you pass, right? No. No, this has nothing to do with uh, any analysis of how frequently numbers come up. I can't help you there. <laughs> Uh, what I can help you with is if you play, do you want to win $8 or do you want to win $16? Um, I can help you win $16. Play the biggest numbers you can. But if everybody does that, then they'll become the most popular numbers and lose your advantage. So, yeah. What's that? I mean, it's, if you use it in the way it's intended for an entertainment, if you kind of daydream about what it would be like to suddenly have millions of dollars, then it's fine. Do you think that's going to the average regular spend expense? Um, that data is not available publicly. The, well, actually, even, even the, the companies that run the systems, one of which I used to work for, don't um, collect any individualized customer data. So they really, there's really no way to know that. <coughs> These are these are completely anonymous transactions. It's really, um, I suppose they could track um, running a play slip through through the terminal. I guess that would be the one way you could track that. But you still don't know <coughs> is it one person putting in several play slips or is it you know, people in line each each running through? And I've I've been in stores where people are not using the play slips. They have their numbers written down and they, and they tell the clerk. 